traditional biology. <laughs> We are encouraging students to have a startup company on their own. Our vision is to be recognized in both teaching and research. We have a retirement function for the retiring employees on the last working day of the month. I have completed my last eight years of service in this institution. This institution only motivated me. Thanks a lot for the support given by you. I would like to mention this is one of the best places I have enjoyed working there. May God bring more love to you. I can look up in your future. They come with their family, friends, their colleagues, and they plant a tree. They do come back to the, you know, the uh, institute to see how their plant is growing. So there's a connect. Wish all the retiring uh, employees all the very best in their future endeavors. Thank you. The Institute of Eminence Scheme has been launched by the Government of India to empower higher educational institutions and help them become world-class teaching and research institutions. IIT Madras is proud to have been selected as one of the Select Institutes of Excellence. As part of our commitment to the cause of fostering world-class research, IIT Madras has set up a number of research initiatives in diverse fields of contemporary relevance. Many of these initiatives will go on to become centers of excellence within the IIT Madras system. A total of 68 research initiatives belonging to 21 identified technology clusters are presently underway. As part of these initiatives, it is proposed to host a series of webinars from each cluster to showcase the innovative research being generated to various stakeholders like researchers, industrialists and policy makers. These webinars will give an opportunity to engage in conversation with eminent faculty from IIT Madras and other international researchers and also to find more collaboration in those research areas. So why wait? Click the link below to be a part of this. Hello and good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the Office of Global Engagement, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 48th webinar from the IRIS webinar series. My name is Richard George Phillip and I'm a part of the Office of Global Engagement. The Institute of Eminence Scheme was launched by the Government of India to empower higher educational institutions and help them become world-class teaching and research institutions. IIT Madras is proud to have been selected as one of the Institute of Eminence. As you may be aware, IIT Madras has been ranked as number one institute in India in both overall and engineering categories in the NIR of 2021 rankings. IIT Madras has backed the top rank in overall category for the third consecutive year and number one in engineering category for the sixth consecutive year. In the newly launched category of research institutions, IIT Madras has been ranked number two in the country. A total of 68 research initiatives belonging to 21 identified technology clusters are presently underway at IIT Madras. As a part of these initiatives, the IRIS webinar series aims to showcase the innovative research being generated to various stakeholders like students, researchers, industrialists, and policy makers. From the medicine and biology technology cluster, the research initiative presenting today is titled Multi-Scale Digital Neuroanatomy led by Dr. Banikandar Narayan. The goal of the proposed center is to map inner space. Combining experimental and computational methods, the center is creating unprecedented petabyte scale 3D microscopic molecular maps of brains 
to help answer open questions about our brain's evolution, development, and disease. Dr. Manikandan Narayanan is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Madras. He enjoys research that harnesses the power of computation to tease apart the molecular interactions underlying life. He obtained his PhD in computer science from the University of California at Berkeley and has held senior research scientist positions at Merck Research Labs and NIH National Institutes of Health prior to joining IIT Madras. He is a Sibel Scholar Class of 2003, author of well-cited computational systems biology research articles and currently a Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance Intermediate Fellow. Joining us as a speaker today is Professor Monashankar Shivaprakasham. Professor Monashankar is currently a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Madras and heads the Healthcare Technology Innovation Center, HTIC. After his PhD and postdoc stint in the US, he returned to India in late 2008 with the goal of developing indigenous medical technologies and set up HTIC in 2011. Since then, HTIC has grown into a unique and leading medtech innovation ecosystem in the country bringing together around 40 medical institutions, industries, government agencies in developing and deploying affordable healthcare technologies. He received the Indian National Academy of Engineering Young Engineer Award and IITM's R&D Early Career Award. He has over 200 research publications in leading journals and conferences. Thank you for being with us today, Professor Manikand and Professor Monashankar. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the webinar today, Professor Partha Mitra. Professor Mitra is a curriculum professor of biomathematics at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, a theoretical physicist by training from his PhD at Harvard Uni University. His research is centered around intelligent machines employing both theoretical and experimental work. An organizing idea behind his research is that there may be a common underlying mathematical principles that constrain evolved biological systems and human engineered systems. He has received prestigious awards orders, including election, member of IEEE, and HN, HN Mahabala Distinguished Chair Professor in Computational Brain Research at IIT Madras. Thank you for being with us today, Professor Mitra. We're very excited that you could be a part of this session. We also have a very distinguished panel with faculty and scientists from various departments across institutions worldwide joining us. We have professors Dr. Anand Raghunathan, Dr. Mriganka Sur, Dr. Brendan Billings, Dr. Paul Manjur, Dr. Jaira Joseph, Dr. Sukhendu Das, Dr. Srinivasa Kumar, Dr. Sudhano Chakrabarti, and Dr. Karthik Raman on the panel with us today. A warm welcome to all of you. And before we start, a note to the participants, please use the Q&A to enter your questions and upload the questions that interest you so that the moderator can prioritize them later. Over to you, Professor Manikandan. Thanks for the introduction. Let me um, start sharing the screen. And can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So thanks for the thanks for the introduction. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, everyone here uh, to our research initiative on multi-scale digital neuroanatomy. So we will cover some high level objectives of the center and what really drives us towards uh, this project of mapping brains at very high resolution. Uh, as uh, Richu had just uh, said, our goal uh, really is to map inner space of arguably the uh, most complex uh, organ in our human body, uh, that is the brain. And uh, you, could, you could argue it is complex in terms of the number of neurons. So there are like uh, about 80 plus billion neurons and trillions of connections among the neurons. And every thought that we have, uh, every conversation we are having, including participation as a webinar, the, the speech I'm producing, the way you are listening, all of that, uh, the brain has a major role in it. And almost every, uh, every organ or organ system in the body is influenced by the brain and the brain influences it. So it's very natural uh, to ask this question of mapping the inner space of the brain. And uh, you may wonder if it is such an important organ, uh, have, haven't people already studied it? I mean, the initial map of, uh, uh, of the brain by uh, a scientist Broadman was in the 1900s. And so century uh, has, has happened and uh, do we not yet have a complete map of the brain? The answer is yes and no. We have a major understanding of 
of, of many aspects of the architecture of the brain. By architecture, I mean the structure and organization of the different uh, parts of the brain, the different cells of the brain, the different molecules or the genes that make up the cells in the brain, but still there are worlds undiscovered. And uh, so this haiku uh, very nicely captures it, residing within us are undiscovered worlds and let's just breathe in and, uh, and explore it. And in terms of the, uh, the specific vision of the center, uh, it's to decipher the architecture of the human brain at very high unprecedented molecular and cellular resolution. But what we mean by unprecedented, Mohan will later uh, give you a very nice uh, picture of it, uh, but at a, at a resolution that is not captured by current brain initiators. So that is really the goal of the center and uh, quite ambitious goal. Uh, and, and so it's very nice to be part of the center. And by developing, and, and this is only possible if we have automated pipelines, uh, which combines uh, artfully experimental and computational uh, methods to achieve at high throughput mapping of these human brains at such high resolutions. And what do we use this for? So in addition to satisfying our natural curiosity about the worlds undiscovered within our brains, we would like to use these uh, measurements that we have made, this detailed mapping of the architecture, which we store in a digital format. So the digitized 3D microscopic volumes of this human brains and also other related uh, species, other species brains um, in terms of both the cellular resolution maps and also molecular maps. So these are uh, to the resolution of single cells. So when we mean unprecedented cellular resolution, we are looking at genes within single cells. So that is our goal is to look at also genes within single cells that make up uh, certain regions of the brain from human and non-human brains to answer certain open unresolved questions about how our brain works. This is a very natural question to ask. So what is the architecture? What is the relation between the structure and function of the brain? So how does the architecture dictate the functions? How our brains work? How do they develop? So from fetal brains all the way to childhood brains to adult brains, how our brains develop? And if we look at human and other species brains, so how do they, how have they evolved over time? Right? And, uh, and, in, and, and finally, uh, how, what goes wrong when a disease affects the brain? Right? So those are the major goals. Uh, that that drive us towards mapping uh, the human brain and other species brains at, uh, at unprecedented uh, resolutions. And this is not possible with just uh, with just uh, one or a, a few persons. It requires expertise across a wide range of fields from neuroscience to uh, molecular profiling, also known as genomics, to engineering, to technology. And so we have, uh, we are very, uh, very grateful that we have this team who are interested towards this central question. So we have faculty colleagues at IIT Madras from my department, computer science department, Professor Sukendu Sutanu and Professor Srinivasa Kumar, and then my colleagues at uh, the E department, Professor Mohan, who will be speaking, uh, speaking next, and then Professor Jairaj. And distinguished sharp professors at IIT Madras, Professor Partha, uh, Professor Mriganga, and Professor Anand. So we have uh, uh, combined expertise across these different areas, uh, contributing towards this uh, towards this project of mapping uh, brain architecture at uh, high resolutions, and uh, coupled with uh, collaborators. Uh, from India and abroad. So they are they span all the way from clinical collaborators to technology collaborators to make these high throughput pipelines, clinical collaborators to get access to the samples, brain samples, which forms the starting point of the project, all the way down to scientific collaborators uh, of who would advise on what brains and what species to select and, and how to go about actually uh, implementing and getting at uh, these objectives. And of course, we have a team of scientists and analysts, uh, and 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 uh, many of them uh, who have joined uh, here today, from uh, from uh, Richa, Jay Kishan, Kirti, Shwetanu, Devashmita, Abhishek, and Shreya, uh, who are all doing the day-to-day -day, uh, the analysis and uh, experiments and scientific uh, activities. So what are we all uh, trying to reach towards? So this is the specific objectives of the center are really to look at generating unique and globally sought after data sets of three types, right? So these are the these are the three types of data sets. The first is when I mean unprecedented, these are really petabyte sized. So you have terapixel, that's trillions of pixels. 
uh, and beta voxels is thousand times more, so more number of uh, volume elements of the brain. So we want to map our human brain at this uh, whole brain, uh, the, the full uh, full human brain, which is about a thousand cc's, uh, at this uh, very high microscopic uh, resolution. That is the first type of data set, and we want to do it on the developing human brain, both fetal brains, and uh, which which really would be a unique resource upon successfully mapping that. And we want to add a molecular characterization to the microscopic images we would obtain uh, in this first data set. So we want to look at, again, certain regions of the human brain and other species brains, uh, but a molecular characterization. By molecular, I mean the actual genes which are active within the cells that make up these different brain regions so that you look at single cell or single nucleus uh, brain transcriptomic data that refers to the transcriptomics refers to the genes that are present in these brains to answer open questions about uh, how our brains have evolved. And uh, finally, uh, looking at uh, the pathogens that are present in our brain. So these are in some sense a dark matter. So we, we know in certain diseases what pathogens are involved in the brain, but in other diseases, uh, we have poor knowledge. So we would like to understand certain neurological disorder, including the brain related complications from from disease such as COVID, uh, we want to do a metagenomic study that will give you bacterial or viral pathogens uh, that may be present in the uh, in the samples of, uh, of of people unfortunately affected with these uh, disorders. These are the specific scientific objectives, and the output of that would be the application of these high throughput experimental computational pipelines to generate these large data sets and make them freely available and involve citizens. Uh, hopefully, many of you who are, who are attending today to interact with this data and, 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 and add your own value to interpreting the data. And I just wanted to, so Mohan is going to go into the, the first part uh, in, in, in some more uh, detail. I just wanted to give a very high level view of the second part, which is this molecular arm of the project. Uh, I work in bioinformatics and computational analysis, and so that is something that I relate to uh, closely, which is... Uh, you want to be able to select a subset of species, uh, which again, using our in, uh, network of international collaborators, uh, we hope to select the right set of species like birds, uh, reptiles, like lizards, crocodiles, and then, uh, and then look at homologous regions, the related regions of the brain across these species and perform molecular level measurements on them to understand what cells uh, are present. And, and uh, we identify these cells using what genes are present within these cells. And then you compare these cell types across these related regions of, of, of evolutionarily, uh, evolutionarily related species to understand how the newest part of the cortex, this neocortex evolves, right? So a neocortex is often thought of as the newest part of the cortex involved in sight and hearing. So how did the mammalian neocortex evolve? And we will address this using the data sets that, we, that I just mentioned before, but looking at the molecular data obtained from related regions of these, of these brains. And in terms of the outreach objectives, the uh, to complement the scientific objectives that I just uh, very briefly discussed, you know, in, in terms of the outreach or the visibility objectives, uh, we would like to expand the successful uh, Center for Computational Brain Research, CCPR, which hosts the distinguished chair professors that I mentioned who are part of this uh, part of this team. Um, so to expand the the annual uh, this winter course that happens. Uh, into an online platform uh, on the Swayam, uh, Swayam platform and to convert it into a massive open online course, right? This MOOC and develop citizen science, like I said before, uh, to have uh, mobile apps where, uh, where citizens could interact with the data and add their own interpretation and value to the data and to establish this international collaborator network and sustain it uh, through, uh, through conferences. So one of the specific things, the first point uh, is actually currently underway. So there is this YM MOOC uh, on this winter course on mission intelligence and brain research. It used to be offered at this uh, Center for Computational Brain Research, CCBR, uh, in uh, in-person format. Now we have expanded it into an online format. And uh, this, this is the website. So if you're interested, you can actually enroll in. And so this uh, course, we have now added new modules related to modern neuroanatomy research, related to brain circuits and cell types, which is of direct relevance to this, to this center. And uh, I have been uh, referring to CCBR uh, quite often now. And so, uh, so this is the right time to 
uh, established among the different objectives that I shared, the, the really the key scientific objective of our center is to add molecular characterization to current efforts which are ongoing at the uh, IIT Madras Human Brain Project. So, which basically is looking at high throughput mapping of whole human and other brains. Uh, so, uh, basically, these three uh, uh, the three units our center on multi scale digital neuroanatomy MDN, and then the Center for Computational Brain Research and IIT and Human Brain Projects are tightly integrated and and provide the necessary ecosystem for uh, for our research initiative like MDN to uh, to even be conceived of in the first place and to. Uh, and hopefully to flourish as, as time goes on. Uh, but as I said, uh, the CCBR has been running for several years, hosts the Singish uh, chat professors and uh, runs annual workshops and, uh, and these annual courses and which gives us the ability to add our molecular level brain circuits and brain cell types as modules to the course, expand it into, the, uh, into this online setup. And then the current efforts in the human brain projects is also tightly integrated with our center in the sense of uh, once we have this high throughput imaging of whole human brains and other brains, we would be able to then add molecular characterization in terms of gene expression data and then finding out the cell types and in terms of these viral or bacterial pathogen metagenomics data and related bioinformatics analysis like computational analysis of such data. So that really, uh, this molecular arm is really the, the focus of the center, uh, along with uh, this integrated focus on high throughput imaging of uh, human brains. And at this point, I would like to transition to, uh, to Mohan, uh, who would uh, explain more about this uh, integrative aspect of high throughput imaging of all human brains. Uh, Mohan, uh, it's, it's over to you. Yeah, thanks, Manu. Um, so, so I'll just dive in on a particular work which we started about two years ago. Uh, the seeds were uh, probably sown about three, four years ago on doing something which today, uh, the reference of which is referred to almost 100 years, more than 100 years. Ago. So I have a, a very interesting graph there uh, since you're talking about exponential curves and all these days. So here is uh, the citations of a particular work plotted across years. And you realize that this is quite extraordinary. After almost 100 years of work, it actually picks up in citations and it continues to grow with each imaging technique that has been brought into uh, both medicine as well as biology to begin with. And this is basically uh, the work by Broadman, uh, who uh, painstakingly, so I, I uh, recommend highly to go and read how he actually did those experiments. You really will be amazed uh, at the sort of uh, detail. And this is what we all refer to actually as today is the brain atlas, the human brain atlas. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, so as of today, there are really no high quality. When we say high quality, we're talking about resolution at the level of cell, uh, a few microns, preferably sub micron, uh, whole brain. That's the other aspect because there have been uh, studies of uh, regions of the brain in the order of a few millimeters squared, but we're talking about thousand cc of brain, little more than that. Can we do that? This is what we set out to, and this effort was funded by uh, uh, Principal Scientific Advisors Office, the Government of India, and uh, Mr. Chris Gopalakrishnan, uh, our uh, very prominent and distinguished alumnus. So we started this work, and I'll give you some details of it. Uh, I know this is a very diverse audience. I thought I'll put up a slide to give you a sense of what we mean by a resolution. Uh, Mani, if you can click the, the next one. Yeah, so for people who are not familiar or somewhat familiar with the brain as a structure, so what you see there is uh, a picture of, uh, these are pictures from our collaborators, Dr. Anita Mahadevan from Nimhans and uh, uh, Daniel Twart from UCLA to give you a sense of what we mean by cellular resolution. So that's a human brain, which is about uh, 1,000 to 1,300 cc. And uh, you would have seen this in probably pictures, uh, probably in some serials. And if you take a cross section, this is what you will see. And probably you're familiar with also the picture that has uh, these color codings. That's essentially um, could be an MRI, an fMRI, or a DTI. And that's pretty much around one millimeter, a few millimeters in some cases. But if you want to organizationally understand the brain, 
right? You need two things. First is you need a cellular resolution and you need the connectivity, right? So that comes at only 10 microns, right? Which means that you probably have to image it at one tenth of it. So that is the complexity and you have to do this uh, across 1300 CC. So well, well, move to the next slide. I just want you to think about what that means in terms of the data that will be collected. Right? Uh, so what is the global status in whole brain histology? The, the operative word is a whole brain. It's been uh, done quite successfully uh, in mouse and uh, uh, marmoset brains, but human brains, uh, it's been quite challenging. So there are very, very, very limited data sets, uh, both in terms of uh, number of brains as well as number of sections uh, when it comes to human. And I've sort of listed uh, representatively across the globe four major efforts. And the practical challenges I quickly can imagine, which is how do you acquire these brains and how do you section them across uh, the entire brain, which will probably lead to about a few thousands of sections, close to 10,000 sections, if you were to do it uh, very finely. And you have to image them at a very, very high resolution in plane. Right? And uh, if you have ever been to the kitchen and if you try to cut some large object in a very thin way, it inevitably breaks. Right? So that's the first thing that uh, physically you have to handle this even before you apply your electronics and uh, informatics to it. That's an extremely exciting and challenging project. So we took this up. Uh, that's what we really wanted to do. One point I wanted to make is, it's very interesting how the global force is also shaping in a way uh, that people are really keen on doing this. Um, recently, um, you can look it up on the web, NIH is uh, putting major efforts in uh, moving, sort of transitioning from mouse brain uh, towards the human brain starting from later part of this year. So Mani, the next slide, please. So now comes to the, the meat of it, uh, figuratively and literally. Um, so this is what we have in the lab. So if you ever come to this lab, uh, you'll be both uh, sort of exhilarated as well as excited because we take a real human brain post-mortem acquired through our clinical collaborators from CMC Vellore, Nimhans in Bangalore and Savita Medical College Hospital in Chennai. Um, we fix them. I don't want to go into the details of how we do it. Uh, then we freeze them um, at minus 80 degrees. So it starts with a lot of excitement even to begin with. Then we section them. You'll see the video of it. We'll section, we'll section them at 10 to 20 micron. And when you section something at 10 to 20 microns, you can quickly imagine you have, need to have a very uh, robust way to handle such a fragile tissue thousands of times, right? So it's a very tricky process, right? It involves physics, chemistry, uh, and a lot of engineering. So there is a particular technique uh, which uh, we use, which was pioneered uh, into a, a very reliable process uh, by uh, Professor Pata Mitra, who's the moderator here. And uh, then we stain them for people who are familiar with uh, pathology. Uh, then we cover slip them. Then we scan them to a high resolution microscope. And then, it enters the informatics pipeline. And I won't go into the details of anything, that's a talk by itself, uh, except to say that the informatics pipeline, we already had a uh, lot of experience about five years ago uh, when we started working on mouse brain. And of course, the whole thing changes here because you're talking about thousand times uh, the volume, right? So if you had done the calculation while I was uh, making a reference to how much is this, right? So it is really close to petabytes. Right? So if you even assume a uh, very conservative 7,000 sections of around 20 microns, and you image the, uh, each section at 0.5 micron resolution, you will end up with close to petabyte of data, right? So now if you want to do this in a reliable manner, this now changes into an engineering and a technology problem. You need a pipeline, a physical and a physical chemical and a engineering pipeline uh, that is both repeatable and automated. Only then you can ensure quality. So with that, let me uh, sort of uh, tell you the status of what uh, this uh, lab is today. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So I'm very sort of happy to tell you that we have prototyped this entire uh, process uh, using a uh, uh, whole postmortem goat brain. And we are currently uh, sectioning and imaging a postmortem fetal brain, which is a data section week of 21 weeks. And we have about seven 
a uh, little more than that. We acquired a couple more recently. Um, close to 10 postmortem adult and fetal human brains we have. And uh, you can imagine this is unprecedented. So if we image all of these and uh, we intend to actually release this data publicly because we want this uh, to be a scientific endeavor uh, that uh, benefits the whole neuroscience community and the other associated community. So this is the status of the project. And now, since uh, all of you couldn't be here in the lab, we have brought the lab to you. Uh, so we'll play the video of how these whole brains are acquired, sectioned, imaged, and converted to digital form. Go ahead, please. So that's the title of the project, the technical title um, that tells you uh, that it is both computational as well as experimental, and uh, it's going to lead to terapixel images. So this is the layout of the lab. Uh, it is uh, very finely controlled in terms of temperature and humidity. And this is the workflow. We acquire the sample. This is the postmodern uh, human brain. And we get a lot of data about it clinically uh, and other aspects. Then we freeze the brain. We freeze it. Uh, you will see that it's actually accelerated. Um, so now that we have frozen, it's converted to a block. Right? So now it's a top view, so you can't see the blade, but the blade is actually just moving. And uh, voila, you have a 20 micron section, right? As I said, the 20 micron section has to be transferred into uh, the, the, the glass slide in a very reliable manner. And uh, we use a, a UV, which basically, if you remember your photoresist, it transfers the tissue now from the uh, tape into the glass, which is what you see right now. A little bit of lag there, but it probably turned out to be good. Actually, you see the, the interface. So now this is for two by three slide. Now, how do you do this in a six by eight, which is about uh, almost uh, uh, two palms together, right? Because now this is almost holding a, a large tile. So we have uh, created a lot of instrumentation. It's done by Professor Gerard Joseph, uh, who's here in the panel. Um, and uh, we do a lot of imaging. We do an MRI imaging before, then we do a, a block face imaging. And now that we have this tissue uh, on a glass slide, we now stain it uh, for different things. We use an SL or HNE at the regular stain, uh, or we use a certain antibodies when you want to look for uh, something particular. And uh, again, we have adapted this to large format slides. So this is the first time uh, as uh, we know it, it's been done. Uh, and of course, uh, it's a manual, but you know, as we said, if you want to do um, uh, robust and repeatable to ensure quality, you need some automations. And that's the automation that we have developed. Uh, these papers are being written up as we are speaking. So these will be very, very uh, exciting papers when it comes out. And then finally, they are uh, cover slip. And uh, as you can see, the numbers of sections are very high. So we have digitally ways to track all of them. And literally, we'll be having like close to probably uh, 100,000 sections in the next uh, few years of this project. And then now comes the in-plane resolution, right? So that is Dr. Jay Kishan, Jay Kumar, uh, very experienced neuroscientist who is actually imaging them using a very uh, high throughput uh, digital image. Of. And that's what you see. And now that will yield the digital images. And uh, for the interest of time, uh, I'm not going into the computational pipeline of it, uh, which actually takes those images, segments them in terms of cellular resolution, then it maps the connectivity. So this is just to give you a sense of um, how it is done. So with that, uh, I, I turn it over to Mani and we'll have questions towards the end of the session. Uh, thanks, Mohan. Yeah, so uh, basically, um, uh, Mohan has very nicely summarized the scale of the data that are currently being generated. Uh, as I have already said, the key objective is to add uh, further scale. So that is why we call it as a multi-scale uh, neuroanatomy project. So in addition to this imaging, high resolution imaging scale, we wanted to add a molecular scale. And uh, we really want to, without going into the uh, all of these uh, points, we want to really see an Indian brain initiative that is on par with uh, global uh, brain initiatives that has the potential to attract researchers, students, 
postdoctoral fellows, foreign visitors to IIT Madras to involve the uh, citizens in, uh, in interacting with this data. And uh, there are some uh, publications uh, that I have mentioned here. So in our website, we will add more uh, as, we, uh, as we proceed along with the project. And uh, these uh, cover uh, all the way from uh, neuroanatomy to computational or uh, single cell analysis from different members of, uh, of the team, uh, some of whom are here, many of whom are here. So if you're interested to learn more, so please contact us at uh, these email addresses and you have uh, information about the, uh, the center, uh, about this research initiative at these particular websites. And if you're interested in the SWIM course, uh, then there are these links. I'll just leave you with this uh, haiku again, and uh, thanks for your interest and uh, time listening to us. Hi, um, <clears throat> Mani, uh, this is Partha. Um, yes, uh, would you mind, because there's a question about the course, uh, can you put the link for the course? Um, I guess the oh, answer is no. Okay, sure, yeah, yeah, I will do that. Yeah. And um, uh, how much time do we have for questions, et cetera? So I think it would be around uh, 10, 15 minutes. So that is my okay. understanding for the panel. Yeah. All right. Um, maybe, uh, first of all, very nice talks. Um, if I may, uh, a few questions have been asked in the uh, uh, Q&A session. I would encourage attendees to ask uh, uh, further questions. Um, and I will pick a few up, but I would first like to invite maybe uh, Paul Manger. Paul, uh, can you hear me? Uh, maybe unmute yourself. No, I can, I can hear you. Yes, Martha. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Uh, Paul, uh, do you want to say a, a word about yourself and also uh, just comment on the significance of what uh, Mohan and Mani are putting together here? Well, what they're getting together is fantastic. I mean, these detailed... Um, digital atlases of human brains and other brains are just not readily available to the public. And so having them with such detail, done with such precision, one of the, one of the very nice things from the video is the, the, the tape, the tape way of um, getting the section from the block onto the slide removes um, somewhere where a lot of... Um, error can come in when you, if you're mounting them manually or floating like, like we typically do. So that's, that's giving some really nice stuff there. And I think in the long run, it's going to provide so much data that so many different people will use. It will be an awesome addition to the neuroscience world. Uh, thanks, Paul. And uh, uh, Paul, uh, you didn't say a, a word about yourself. Uh, you may want to just uh, uh, say, say something about your experience. And um, we, we are, of course, inviting you. Uh, uh, I think Mohan and Mani are inviting you to come and participate in this project. So that'll be quite exciting as well. Uh, my apologies. I'm a little shy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, work, I, I mainly work on brain, lots of brains of different mammals. So a whole range of different species from platypus and echidnas through to whales and dolphins and chimpanzees and other primates. Pretty much uh, I, I've worked on maybe about 140 different species of mammals, but done very, very little on the human brain. It's uh, been one of the things I've always thought, well, there's a lot of people already working on it. So why compete when I can work on something like a pangolin and have no competition? So that, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> so so uh, let, let me then uh, turn to some of the questions and, and pose it to the uh, panelists. Um, and uh, one of them I'll actually pose to uh, Anand. Uh, Anand, if you want to unmute yourself, you know, maybe say a, couple of words and the question came up about it says can we make uh, robots you know kind of by learning from this project but the underlying question perhaps is what can we learn from this kind of project that will then influence uh, you know hardware or software that uh, uh, that, that is being uh, uh, that is being made Absolutely. Uh, hi, Partha, um, Mohan, Mani, all, all of you. Um, uh, it's a great presentation. Uh, can you hear me, Partha? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm very excited to be involved in this uh, in this endeavor. Um, my own background comes from 
um, uh, the side of more on the side of computing systems, uh, but especially with the focus on on hardware um, and how um, you know new generations of um, hardware can enable workloads of the future. Uh, so from that that perspective, uh, I'm I'm quite excited. Uh, I think the, great to see the project getting to a stage where we are starting to produce tons of data because I think that really brings up the challenges that. Uh, hopefully, I can I can help address. Um, so, from an uh, purely from an imaging perspective, before I get to the question, uh, pr from the from an imaging perspective, uh, you know we have cell phones with uh, tens of megabytes of data, and of course, you know you can we have other applications where uh, you know maybe um, uh, autonomous vehicles and so on, where where we are processing images in the gigabytes range. But you know, suddenly going to tera and peta scale, I think will um, present a new and interesting challenges uh, for processing. Uh, that will, um, of course, enable the scientific advances uh, it, for in projects like this one in the near future. But uh, I, I strongly believe maybe you know a decade or so down the road will actually uh, also become uh, relevant in more mainstream commercial applications. So uh, I'm I'm excited uh, to start to look at those challenges and, and address, hopefully address some of them. Uh, but coming to the question, um, uh, yes, I mean obviously. Um, uh, the, the the I guess uh, uh, missing um, uh, piece I would say maybe you know in robotics or one of the large missing pieces is is the intelligence um, and and um, I think uh, you know there's certainly been a lot of um, advances in the last um, decade or so in um, in uh, deep learning particularly deep neural networks uh, which of course people you know interchangeably these days have you know there is very little. Um, uh, reticence to interchangeably using the words machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, which you know some people may still debate, but I think there's still a big gap, and and I think hopefully um, our learnings from from the brain um, and and how it how it um, realizes intelligence and does so very efficiently, uh, hopefully will inform future developments in in machine intelligence. Um, you know, um, uh, some of these. Uh, man versus machine contests that we see today, right? The game of Go and so on and so forth. Um, I think uh, the hidden uh, footnote is that the machine consumes like, you know, 10,000 times more power or energy than the human brain. Uh, although it, in some cases, functionally, it is beating the human brain. It's not really an ISO energy contest. And so um, I, to me, a great uh, stretch goal for, for you know, machine learning and, the, you know, broadly field of AI is, is can you beat a human in an ISO power or ISO energy contest? Um, so hopefully, hopefully that's one one um, long term direction that can be driven by the the findings that come out of the center. Uh, th thanks, Anand, and uh, I'm going to move to you know so we can address more questions. Please all keep your answers brief. Uh, uh, Mohan, there's a couple of interesting questions have been asked. One about whether you know this approach will help a better, more microscopic understanding of brain connectivity. I think maybe you want to comment on the innovative approach we are taking you know unique new approach to human brain connectivity uh, and after that uh, uh, also a, a question uh, has come up about um, how this uh, will help us um, uh, uh, you know understand what happened to the person while they were alive or you know what diseases so maybe take both of those questions together and, and address uh, what's the innovative connectivity aspect of this proposal and how will this knowledge, you know, maybe, you know, in that specific context also shed some light into uh, disease? Yeah, so the moment you want to do connectivity, there are two things that you need, right? First is you need reasonable amount of space, right? Basically, you need to be able to image long enough and wide enough or rather volume wise right? that we are doing. So that's the first uh, problem we have solved rather yeah, we think we are solving, uh, we will see it. Uh, the second aspect is you need a biologically sensitive and selective uh, way that you can isolate them, right? Isolate meaning not in a physical sense, but you can see them. So we are looking at uh, certain pathologies where uh, the, the antibody staining will bring out these uh, connectivities uh, through a pretty long uh, sort of multiple synapses and multiple connections. So you will see that uh, there are certain pathologies. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of it at this point of time. Uh, there are specific neuropathologies caused by uh, external pathogens, um, uh, which 
beautifully right, uh, give you this, uh, this tracer, which naturally happens. And uh, that, so these two combined are going to give us this connectivity uh, map. So. Um, and and uh, can you comment on uh, um, uh, the, uh, well, a couple of questions. Um, are we doing it? Are you doing any work on the developing brain? And also the fact that uh, you're looking at postmortem brains that's going to be different from live brains. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess the underlying question is, is it so different um, that, you know, things will be changed? What can we learn about, people ask this question, right? And you're studying a, a postmortem brain. How can you learn about the live brain in this manner? Are you learning about that person's brain when they were alive? You know, what is the kind of knowledge that will, come out from studying postmodern brains. The subtext is that there's, of course, um, uh, kind of uh, functional imaging uh, that perhaps has poorer resolution that, that you do in live brain. So how does it complement those techniques? So right. development so, and uh, postmodern brain. Yeah. So the first question is, yes. Uh, sorry, probably I didn't explicitly mention it. Uh, what we are, in fact, starting with, with the developing brain. So we have about uh, uh, four uh, to five uh, fetal brains that are that have been acquired, and uh, we will be releasing the the first uh, fetal brain uh, data uh, probably towards the end of this year publicly. So yes, we are actually doing that. In fact, that's the first brain data. Um, with related to post mortem, or to put it more crudely, what are you going to get from studying a dead brain? Right. So, if you understand that structure and function uh, to uh, connected, but at the same time, uh, independently measurable uh, aspects of the brain. So the cytoarchitecture is very well preserved, right? it's extremely well preserved. Uh, as long as you uh, acquire the brains carefully and fix them carefully. And so that is the underlying, um, it's not just a premise, it's the underlying uh, property of the brain and the cells that allow us to do this. I mean, that's why pathology is considered, you know, literally the golden standard. Right? So, uh, cancer is probably an easier uh, example uh, for people who are not that familiar with um, uh, pathology. Essentially, the decision, the final decision, uh, is made uh, to pronounce a particular uh, type of uh, disease is to look at how the cells are. Right? So that's essentially how it is done. So. The combining structure and function is being done, it has to be done only when uh, the organ is alive. So that has been done in fMRI. But as you know, we are talking about literally almost four or five orders of resolution. Uh, so while you can get gross uh, delineation, combining structure and function, but if you want to go even one order below, let alone five orders, uh, the only way is you will have to look at the tissue in a cellular resolution, which means, as you know, uh, at least today, there is no direct way to image the brain, uh, not just optically. I mean, there's this uh, big helmet all of us have uh, evolutionarily. So there is no way for you to look into the brain unless you take the brain out. Right. So, mm -hmm. Th th Thanks, Mohan. Uh, maybe I'll uh, pose one question to Mani. And M Mani, if, if uh, we are running out of time, then you can also wrap after that. Um, uh, I, I would, if you, if there is a little time, I would uh, like to hear from Richa about her kind of on the ground experience in, in setting up the lab and so on. Um, so a Mani question for you, question came up about neurodegenerative diseases. Um, can this lead to early detection of neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, I, I suppose you cannot do it in the same person because this is postmortem, but can you learn something that will lead to uh, helping of early diagnosis of neurodegenerative diseases? Oh. So uh, basically in uh, several neurological diseases or neurodegenerative diseases, what, what current research is mostly focused on is understanding the genetic causes and understanding uh, how, how it has an effect, how the genotype or the genetic uh, information of the patient has an effect on or the genes and other things which gets affected in the disease. And what we are trying to aim for here is understanding if there is an environmental component to these neurological diseases, such as viral or, pathog viral or bacterial pathogens. So that could help us uh, tell that there may be these hidden things that we have not 
look so far and if we are able to find detect some so that may suggest some avenues which uh, which uh, which looks at let's say if you are able to detect something in the cerebrospinal fluid so then that may lead to at least for those patients who have uh, other visible symptoms or other kind of borderline symptoms to test their CSL fluid potentially for, for certain pathogens that we may find, right? But it is too early to say, I would just say that uh, by looking at these environmental causes of neurological diseases compared to the genetic causes, which are mostly currently focused on, we may be able to recover some of the, uh, some other biomarkers other than the ones that are currently, uh, currently being explored. Uh, but as I said, uh, only the data would say for sure. And I will, I will just uh, stop there so that Richa could, uh, uh, could add her. Yeah, share, share. Uh, Richa, uh, hey. uh, I know has been the, uh, really the person leading the charge on the experimental fraud. So we should definitely hear from her. What the Thank experience you, has been like. And, uh, um, and, 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 and Richa, uh, uh, if you could also, Jay, if you could put the link to the course registration somewhere. I, I don't know how to put it, but uh, yeah, Richard, go ahead, please. Yep. So thank you, Partha. Thank you for, you know, asking me to be part of this great project. Uh, it's very, it's been very, very challenging, but at the same time, given that it was a lockdown period, we have collected data and we do have, uh, as Mohan highlighted, a fetal brain sample in our pipeline. And hopefully by the end of this year, we will have two fetal brain processed and publicly displayed. Now, the process of doing this high resolution anatomy from the starting of a postmortem brain is quite challenging because these are human sample. It's very different uh, compared to animal samples where it's very controlled. Here, this lot uh, involved in terms of the PMI, how we do the fixation, then the entire freezing process because we are really talking about large sample freezing. The good news is we are set up in an engineering institute for each and every single step. We have been working on the engineering solution to make it more consistent and hopefully we can produce the high throughput data which this project aims to do. So both good and bad, it's challenging, but it's been exciting. And the data which we are hoping to create will definitely be quite uh, trendsetter in its own way. Thanks, thanks Richa. Uh, Mani, I hand this over to you. Uh, thanks, Parda. Yeah, so we will uh, we will just see if we can answer some of the questions again online and maybe uh, wrap at this point, uh, wrap up at this point. Is that okay, Mohan? Also? Yeah, we should. I think, uh, yeah. I think we have answered the key questions. So I just thank everyone who joined, uh, all the attendees, all the panelists, and uh, thanks for this wonderful opportunity to introduce you all to this center. Uh, and uh, we, you have all the contacts that we have provided, and so hopefully uh, those who are interested can learn, learn more and uh, stay, stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. It was a real pleasure to see the setup and actually see more detail about what's going on after our conversations over the past few months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thanks for you and uh, Brendan uh, and everyone else who have joined. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Manikandan. Thank you, Professor Monashankar. And thanks to everybody on the panel for spending all this time uh, explaining what your research is about and answering all of the questions. I'm sure the participants you know, are very invested in this and all of, you know, from all of us, we hope that the research goes well and we wish you all the very best. Thanks to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.